Well, thank you for joining us for our Supercharged September video series. My name is Lisa Drake, and I am Assistant Director of Fleet Electrification at Merchants Fleet. I'm supercharged to be joined by Jim Hanna, Director of Sustainability, Construction Operations and Data Center Equipment with Microsoft. So we'll talk about data center sustainability and what businesses like Microsoft are doing to stay ahead of the curve. So welcome to the Supercharged series, Jim, and uh, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, definitely. Hey, Lisa, it's good to see you again. Um, so hey, everyone, Jim Hanna. I've been with Microsoft now for about nine and a half years. Uh, I joined the company to start up the data center sustainability team. Interestingly, uh, you know, as a large technology company, we hadn't been focusing on on the footprint of our data centers uh, too exclusively, and had really just been focusing on offices and employee travel as our primary uh, environmental footprint. But it, with the hyperscale growth of the hyperscale cloud infrastructure, um, that became really Microsoft's primary environmental footprint globally, and so they they brought me on to to start up and lead that team. Before Microsoft, I served uh, as Chief Sustainability Officer at Starbucks for a number of years, and then uh, also worked out in Yellowstone National Park for a company called Zantara Parks and, uh, and Resorts that ran all the park operations uh, in Yellowstone. Pretty good, pretty magical place to be, but I've had a number of really cool jobs in my career. Uh, always focused on the corporate sustainability side, though. Yeah, oh, that's great. Such a great, such a great background and story, and such great organizations that that you've been with. And I'm glad you opened with that thought about um, just the footprint of of data centers growing that, you know, there's such an extraordinary, there is such an extraordinary surge in data creation happening today with advances in technology and ever increasing computing power and speeds and, um, you know, really exponential growth in data. And so, you know, that has to be challenging to keep up with. You know, we, we would love to have the problem of an ever increasing number of trucks on the road every day. Um, with our fleets, but um, you know the, it, there is a challenge there. So I'd love to hear a little bit about how Microsoft's um, approaching that escalating demand for data centers and how do you stay ahead of it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and first off, I mean, I think for me the the growth of data centers reflects a massive growth in in opportunity. You know, and, and I, I harken back to when I was debating whether or not to join Microsoft, you know, or stay with Starbucks. who are two amazing companies and. And I was doing some research on on data centers in the cloud, and didn't really know much about about the industry. But I was watching this video of this this cancer researcher, um, and his story was essentially that prior to to Azure and cloud infrastructure and, and the use of cloud computing, it took over six months to um, to map the human genome, um, which is really critical in cancer research. And with the advent of cloud computing that came along with that, and all the services. Um, he was now able to do that in one day. And so when you look at the opportunities that the growth of hyperscale cloud really provide, it's pretty exciting, you know, and, but you're right, Lisa, I mean, the, the, the infrastructure of cloud, it's certainly not in the cloud, it's concrete, it's steel, it's, it's a lot of servers, you know, it's, it's significant electricity consumption, it's significant water consumption for cooling. We use a lot of land um, in, in the construction of our data centers as well. So from an infrastructure perspective, certainly data centers um, are a significant resource user. And for Microsoft, it's really exciting uh, to work for a technology company that, that resources um, its targets and resources its goals around sustainability. So we are really able to focus very heavily on in the energy space, um, being front front runners and really leaders in the development of renewable energies around, around the world um, and really investing heavily in, in infrastructure development, investing heavily in PPAs to bring more and more renewables onto the grid, um, you know, so we can really ensure that our data centers are powered by 100% renewable energy. On the water side as well, um, it's interesting, there's this, this inverse relationship between energy and water for cooling. And so we're able to design our data centers efficiently so that in regions where we have, um, where there's water scarcity and water challenges, um, we can use more more cooling that's less water intensive or even zero water usage in those data centers um, to make sure that we're not we're not overburdening those communities from a water use perspective. And the company certainly has you know commitments around being carbon negative, um, which you know we, we toss around these terms like carbon neutral and carbon negative and, and like. But for Microsoft, it's it's essentially going all the way back to the founding of the company and all the footprint we've ever actually created from a carbon perspective and making sure we're able to remove and mitigate that for, that footprint as well. Um, so yeah, it's it's 
it's both a it's a dichotomy because we're we're large users of energy, water, and resources, but we also, as as a leading edge company, are are committed to focusing on mitigating and zeroing out um, in a net way some of those those impacts that we have as a company. And again, I mean, keeping in mind that the the value out of data centers to to the global community is is significant. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot to dig into there. You know, I was thinking about how just the word cloud makes it feel like it's this nebulous thing. And, it, you know, it, for your 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 day to day, very aware of, you know, this is brick and mortar and electrical equipment and electrical power. And, you know, it's not just free. It's not just, right. you know, magic. Not and, floating in the cloud. No. Nope. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's uh, it's helpful, to, you know, to hear about how you how Microsoft thinks about about those impacts and um, I guess what are there any particular challenges that you that you're really trying to break through and find new solutions for? Yeah, I think I think for us the one of the biggest challenges is and this has been for me in my career uh, throughout the sustainability world and corporate sustainability for 30 years now. Um, the biggest challenge is really trying to create that linkage from a corporate perspective between investment and sustainability and and really driving growth of the business and driving profitability of the business. Um, you know, and as you know, speaking sustainability professional, sustainability professional, some of our biggest challenges we have internally are, are gaining traction for our initiatives, you know, gaining internal buy-in and internal buy-off for the things we're trying to get the company to invest in, whether it's resources, uh, financial or headcount, or, or even, you know, the ability um, to get mindshare for the work that we're doing. And it's one of the things I'm most proud about in my career and, and my time at Microsoft is we're able to both create the opportunity for business growth while we're creating the opportunity to, re to reduce our overall footprint at the same time. I'll, I'll give you a good example. Um, you know, we, we speak a lot of circular economy in the in the sustainability world. And, and for me, circular economy is a critical component to developing new business models. There's certainly an opportunity, you know, to reduce environmental footprint viral footprint of companies through circularity and getting resources back into the system and the like and you know companies like apple and and siemens and others have done a fantastic job at at doing that for microsoft you know when we when i started internally selling the the circular server program you know to take all these millions of servers we were purchasing you know and we would buy them we would use them up and then we would send them off for recycling to look at the opportunity to create refurbishment, upgrade, reuse of those servers internally um, presented a huge environmental benefit, but it also presented a huge potential business benefit when we talked about when we talked about bottlenecks in supply chains, you know, that were, were problematic at the time and, and alleviating those. When we talked about creating local jobs in communities, you know, where we operate our data centers, when we talked about reducing the overall costs of our data centers and, you know, and, and actually contributing back to the company's bottom line. That's that magic synergy that often we are challenged to face as sustainability professionals is both saving the planet, tackling climate change, you know, tackling water scarcity, and all these different things, but also realizing that we work for for-profit companies and creating those linkages back where we're not just a cost to the company, but actual benefit to the company. And that's where I get most excited, you know, about my work is when I can when I can create those linkages, you know, and it, it's not like pushing a rock up a hill internally to get the, the work that we want done internally. That being said, you know, um, Microsoft is, as I mentioned, super committed to being a cutting edge company um, and being a leader in blazing new pathways when it comes to green building or energy use or water usage or or getting getting renewable energy on the grid, which benefits not just Microsoft, but really benefits all of society when when we can create these systematic changes um, to create much lower environmental impact solutions for water, for energy, for materials. Um, right now, I'm actually working on the, the company is in, is investing directly in in low and zero carbon steel and concrete uh, around the world um, because concrete and steel are some of the biggest uh, embodied carbon impacts that we have with our with our data center space. And, and again, I'm I'm always super proud that Microsoft doesn't just wait for change to happen. We go out and make that change happen so that we can accelerate decarbonization of these massive commodity supply chains. You know that are really critical for. Um, for our embodied carbon uh, commitments and really critical for, you know, if you're geeky like us and talk about things like scope three emissions, you know, reducing our scope three emissions, which a lot of companies are really struggling with. Yeah, that's right. There's a lot, there's a lot wrapped into that and um, not scope three, but I'm thinking about wanting to hear a little more about how the power that uh, is needed to, to, um, to power up those data centers in terms of like the renewable energy approach and how how you build that 
business case, environmental case, and bring those together. And, you know, I'm really relating this to um, also my work with clients in electric vehicles and that, uh, you know, there's, there's emissions opportunities just using grid power and then you can go even cleaner with renewable energy and how, how what can what can we learn from you in terms of microsoft's thinking about that renewable energy that is needed to really power a clean data center yeah and i think you know as you know of any large consumer of electricity which your company is and, and my company is um, sometimes the generation isn't physically near to where the consumption is you know and that's especially true in the united states where um, the middle part of the country is a significant generator of renewable energy and in the and the coastal parts of the country are the significant consumers of that energy. And so companies that are committed to powering their whatever industry they happen to be in by renewable energy um, certainly also need to be considerate of of grid transmission, you know, and, and in this country, especially the, the lack of, of viable grid transmission, which can create, again, an, a business bottleneck for all of us, in addition to not having renewables in line with where the grid actually um, needs to send them for, for our consumption. So, you know, Microsoft has been one of the leaders in developing power purchase agreements and PPAs, which allow us to directly invest in the in the creation of new infrastructure renewables, which is really critical to move beyond just unbundled RECs, which a lot of us have used in the past to to make green claims around, <clears throat> around our energy purchases. Um, but it's also critical for us to be involved in policy conversations, um, in, in conversations around how do we how do we help really bring down some of the some of the blockades to getting more transmission within this country to move the power from where it need where it's generated to where it needs to be, um, and that's a team effort. You know, so any company or any entity that's concerned about the ability of us to meet our climate targets and our renewable energy targets. Um, we need to be focused certainly on transmission and uh, or certainly on, on generation and getting more and more generation onto the grid. But how those electrons move about has really, in most cases, proven to be um, one of the major stalls when it comes to more and more deployment of renewable energy. And our involvement in that from an investment perspective, from a perspective of making sure that, you know, we're directly involved in, in investment of grid transmission, directly involved in that policy piece of it to help accelerate grid transmission is really critical for all of us. And, you know, again, I would, I always encourage fellow users of electricity, um, especially larger users of electricity, who also have the same ambitions around renewable um, to get involved and partner with other companies and partner with other entities who are also focused on the transmission of electricity as one of the critical components. Yeah, that's right on. I think this is new for the fleet managers that, that we work with, that electricity is not what they've been using as the fuel for a number of years. <laughs> for, so it, for sure, for sure. It's, uh, it's, it's, an, it's a newer topic, but when we have a lot, a lot to learn about. Um, do you have any advice about making the business case for EVs and electrification of fleets as a sustainability initiative? Yeah, it's it's so it's it's funny. I mean, I, and I touched on this a moment ago when I was talking about circularity. But but I found, and this this may seem ironic, but I found the best way to get traction on sustainability initiatives is not to talk about sustainability. Um, and and again, I think a lot of my colleagues in the industry find that a bit ironic. And and that our primary goal is you know to help tackle climate change and help tackle water scarcity and food scarcity and all these other big global societal challenges that we face. Um, but, you know, when you place that next to private companies and corporations um, whose also primary goal is to create a return to shareholders, um, it's really critical that we speak that language as sustainability professionals. So regardless of what your industry is in, is in you know, if you have environmental targets and you have environmental commitments as a, as a company, or even I think, you know, in your company where the very nature of the company is to reduce the environmental impact uh, around the world, which is very exciting. Um, in order to get internal traction for the investments that you want your company to make and you want other companies to make in in whether it's climate change or renewable energy or, or other you know quote green topics if we can learn to better speak the language of business and translate the work that we're trying to do back into business metrics um, that's really critical for us to achieve success and to get those greater investments you know i talked about in the circularity space which um, certainly for me I never even talked about sustainability when I was pitching that program internally for circular servers. I really just talked about the business benefits and, and de-risking parts of the business as well. Um, and certainly you all can do that same thing is, is 
keep sustainability kind of in your back pocket when you're when you're talking about justifying investments in new programs or talking about you know creating new programs to tackle climate change and others but you know go to leaders within your company and ask them two very critical questions what keeps you up at night and what are you bonused on and and when they answer those questions, you go back and do the hard work to try to figure out how an investment in a new sustainability initiative within your company, um, you know, would actually help them sleep better at night and it would actually help them make their bonus. And then they'll become your champions really, really quick, regardless of their opinion on climate change, you know, regardless of whether or not their, their bonus is tied to you reducing your environmental footprint or not. That's how you create these real fast internal champions and get a whole lot more resources for your work and get a whole lot more headcount and mind share for the work that you're trying to do within your company. And that's universal. Um, you know, whether you're a, an electric vehicle company, whether you're making coffee, you know, in, in my previous work at Starbucks or whatever it happened to be, um, always tying back to how other business leaders within the company measure their success um, is where I found my most success in sustainability. Um, it's funny, we used to call sustainability the, the gift with purchase at Starbucks where, you know, it was kind of like the thing you got, not for free, but the thing you got along with all the business cases you're able to make for the work that you're trying to do. Um, and I remember when I was, one of the first programs I did at Microsoft was I, I tried to convince the company that we wanted all of our new data centers in the world to be LEED Gold certified. And the initial feedback I got when I, when I pitched that as an environmental program was, there's no way we're going to do this um, because our whole mod, our whole mantra around building data centers was replicate and scale, replicate and scale, because we we're trying to build these things as fast as we could to meet with customer demand. And any anything that anyone proposed that would slow down that train of replicate and scale um, it just wasn't considered. So when I looked at Lead, you know, as something I did at Starbucks. I really looked at the volume build certification opportunity with LEED so that we could just replicate that over and over and over again in our data centers instead of the typical one-off LEED applications that you did. And then it suddenly became a scalable opportunity for the company to meet a whole plethora of environmental demands from different communities around the world, uh, the world on how we built our data centers um, with one program versus a bunch of one-offs. So then it actually helped accelerate a lot of the permitting, actually helped accelerate a lot of um, the compliance that we were looking at um, in these different communities around the world. And, you know, regardless of whether or not it was an environmental program, it just became a scalable program that we were able to do quickly. Um, and we, we built the lead volume certification standard for data centers with US Green Building Council. And now any other data center company in the world can, can use that standard to do the same type of thing. So those are the kind of things that for me are really critical is make the business case for what you're trying to sell internally or, or accomplish internally from a sustainability perspective, and you'll get way more traction. That's really insightful and um, really appreciate your your leadership and Microsoft's leadership in, in putting that lead standard out and um, and making it available for others because this is like we all have to do it together on a great degree to, 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 to have global success. Um, I'm wondering, you know, given you know, you've the, the breadth of your career and, and the nine years now that you've been at Microsoft. Um, you know, you have been a leader. Microsoft has been a leader in so many ways, but I wonder what your, what your overall thought is about the most impactful thing that Microsoft has done. I think for me, I mean, if we keep it within the walls of sustainability, um, the, the most impactful thing that Microsoft has done is a commitment to put the resources toward being a game changer um you know and that might sound cliche but it you know i look at previous companies where i worked and it was always a struggle to get resources and it was always a struggle um you know i, I, I jokingly say when i was at starbucks i mean we had amazing initiatives but we were handed a roll of duct tape and some chicken wire to go solve them you know because that that was the nature of retail is you, you just didn't have a lot of resources to do things and you know one of the one of the cool things about working in the tech industry is we, we have resources to put toward our initiatives and and microsoft's commitment really to to and i'm starting to use a bunch of cliches now but to you know to be that kind of trailblazer to to knock down all the barriers so that other companies can achieve um sustainability outcomes um but to be the ones that solves a lot of those problems up front you know and i i talked about you know you know getting green building certifications for data centers and then offering that to the world you know i talk about our our ability to make the business case for circularity um in server space which really 
you know, can be used as a case study for other companies to say, look, this just this isn't just a green opportunity, it's a business opportunity. So why don't we go build circularity, you know, for our data centers as well to address a lot of these business challenges that we have. Um, you know, and even even in the space now where um, a lot of my focus now is on scope three emissions and really the embodied carbon and construction materials, which frankly, most companies are failing miserably at meeting their targets <laughs> right now at doing. Um, the fact that Microsoft is saying, we have a billion dollar climate innovation fund um, as a company that we're gonna use out there to invest in startups in zero carbon materials or low carbon materials. We're gonna you know, become equity investment investors sometimes in these companies you know, to really help them scale up and really help them accelerate um, and scale up the, decarbon the, the decarbonization of these major supply chains around the world. Um, that's gonna serve everyone, not just Microsoft. And that's one of the things I'm most proud about really is that we create solutions that serve everyone, not just our, our own self-interest as a company. And, and we always have that lens on the investments that we make as a company, the initiatives that we do as a company is how do we blaze the trail so that others don't have to go through the same pain points, you know, and get the same bumps and bruises along the way. Um, and we can really set the table for others to, to solve these initiatives, um, maybe in companies that don't necessarily have the same level of resourcing that we do. That's really powerful and um, really inspirational. So thank you. Right. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it's been really great talking with you today, Jim. I so appreciate you taking some time to be on our Supercharged September series. And um, I am grateful for your time today. Absolutely. And uh, thanks for inviting me. And you are doing famous, amazing work as well. Yeah.